So welcome to the first panel discussion of the 2020 English Rare Film Festival. And it's a very special one because most of us filmmakers, we love the short films and things, but we want to make a feature film. And we're lucky enough to have five feature film directors with us today, which is Anthony Biano, who directed the documentary about the making of Ghostbusters, which is Clean Up the Town, uh, Remembering Ghostbusters. Lucy Townsend, director of Scary Crows. Ashley Thorpe, director of Bolly Rectory. Justin Carter, director of Torn and um, Neil Rowe, director of Alien Outbreak. And before we, we find out, interview the directors, hear some clips from some of their films. I'm Neil Rowe and I directed Alien Outbreak. Um, Ashley? Hi, uh, my name's Ashley Thorpe and I am the director of uh, Borley Rectory. Um, Lucy? I'm Lucy Townsend and I directed Scary Crows. Anthony? I'm Anthony Bueno and I directed Clean Up the Town Remembering Ghostbusters. And last but not least... <laughs> I'm Justin Carter and I directed Torn a Shockumentary. I'm really inspired by everybody in this, 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 this panel today. You've all directed feature films, which is the filmmaker's dream. We love doing shorts, but that feature film is, it's more sellable. You, it, it's, it, it's more sellable with the cinema, putting it online and things. And um, to start with Justin, um, what inspired you to want to direct a feature film and if when you finish you want to pass it over to one of one of the other directors sure um well i've just been obsessed with movies since i was uh you know four or five years old and that was it and it, it was always although not knowing exactly what i wanted to do uh how i wanted to be involved with movies uh, because I, I was so obsessed with them it, it, that was you know always something i wanted to be um involved in and, and over the years um directed writing and directing was something that i'd um sort of uh sort of taken on and and, and those were the roles that I, that I stuck with and then features were you know were always uh, were always the goal uh, and uh, and so that's that's uh that's basically you know how it come for me you know what about what about you, Neil? Because you're you're um you know from from Alien Outbreak, I can tell that your taste seems sort of fairly similar to mine, and um, even in terms of sort of tone and things like that. Did, did, yeah. did that kind of um, your obsession begin sort of early in your life? My, my, I suppose I had to go back to Robot World first, which was our first feature. Um, that, that kind of started as a, as a project more than anything. I, I was trying to, I was trying to build up visual effects freelance work because um, although I, I was working in computer graphics, it, it was sort of moving away from TV and film stuff and more into uh, video 
games and simulators and stuff. And I really had a passion to do the TV and film work. And so Robot World came about just because I, I started doing this freelance visual effects work and I started working on some really, really crummy, you know, sort of student type films, which, you know, which was good, but there was no money in it. And it wasn't really pushing what I wanted to show on my show reel. So I, I always talked about doing a feature film with my brother and one day just kind of, one day, one night, quite drunkenly. Um, so I said, well, let's do it. Uh, let's, let's make a film. I'll, I'll, I'll write it and you can star in it and you'll just, you know, have loads of visual effects in it and it'll be wonderful and great and all that, you know. And I think about five or six years later, finally finished it and got it out there. Um, but yeah, it, for me, it was more of a project to, to, so that I could keep working on, um, working on visual effects. And then, then that, that kind of did fairly well for what it was. And um, we kind of said, well, we got a little pot of money that we made from that. And um, we, we went again with like Alien Outbreak. Uh, how about you, Lucy? A stars align. I honestly don't know how it happened. Um, I kind of just stumbled into it with blind naivety and optimism that, you know, yeah, of course, this feature is no different to doing a short well at least it'd be totally easy um yeah so it was kind of just one of those things that i really hadn't planned enough in advance and i thought it was going to be really simple and then it was what it was and it took me by quite surprised but post-production took more time than the actual shoot because more well years more <laughs> um but it wasn't really something i expected to do it was something that sort of just ended up happening yeah, I think I was just as surprised with it as everyone else was, but it was just like, oh, we're doing this then. Oh, okay. Um, and off it went. So I'm very happy it did go ahead, but it was mostly blind, naive optimism that kept it going. Yeah. Yeah, so Anthony and um, Ashley, your journeys were quite different because, I mean, Ashley, you, you were on your own for a lot of it doing that. And Anthony, you, you were... <laughs> it was a different Anthony how was your journey because your, yours was a different kind of genre in documentary how was that but you still had I mean looking at your credit still a massive team how how was how, how did it how did it become a feature was it supposed to be a feature yeah yeah it was always meant to be a feature it was because we I'd worked on other things before as an editor and and done and done shorts and stuff not as, as a direct well I've done direct, directing shorts but that, that was years ago I barely remember it so I've worked on a lot of other kind of productions and I worked on another feature documentary. And, and it, that was more just about as long as we've got the content, we've got the interviews and we can kind of, you know, create something out of it. So once I'd done that as an editor, I was just like, yeah, yeah, we'll, we'll do another one and we'll bash it out in a year and a half, a piece of cake. And it wasn't, and it took, it took years and, but it was just, we, we, I didn't have any kind of pressure. It was just, we just want to get it done. Apart from trying to hit certain kind of like, okay, there's a, there's a doctor about Ghostbusters. So I was like, oh, there's an anniversary coming up. Right, we'll try and get it for, out for the 25th. And I think it was close to the 35th anniversary when we finally got it out there. So it was, we weren't really under any pressure like that. Um, it was just, we just took our time, but it was always meant to be, it, it changed. The, the, the way the feature, if you want to call it, that was going to be was, it was going to cover all the franchise originally and then it just became about the first film and then we like, we'd, like, we'll make a separate documentary about the second film. But we just wanted to make a very kind of in-depth look into Ghostbusters. So it's, it's you know, it's, it's different. So I don't have to work with actors and, and get performances and things like that, but you still got to make sure the interviews and you're hitting the right beats within the interviews when you're kind of cutting it all together to keep it interesting. Best. <laughs> <laughs> that's been that's been awful but the being it the warm-up bit the, you know the whole kind of going out there when are we going to go how much money have we got to go and do a trip okay we've got enough let's go and do a, a trip over the states and we'll do some more interviews and it'll be great so that part of it for the most part was pretty fun just yeah just everything else <laughs> but anyway here we are Ashley what about you um yeah well, my first feature came about kind of as, a, as an accident really I'd, I'd actually purposely written a feature film uh, called Spring Hill Jack, which was initially in development with Creative England. And um, it, there were some sort of misunderstandings and I started looking, thinking this is going to be really, we're going to have problems here because they, they kind of signed up 
loving the idea and then suddenly there was just lots of confusion and they didn't seem to like the idea anymore and they thought uh oh here we go we're going to end up just tearing this thing to pieces and making it via some kind of committee so i just said you're all right I forget it um and it was kind of out of that despair of trying to make a feature film that i made that i wrote the script which was going to be for like a like a half an hour kind of or 20 minute uh, short in theory uh, for for Bawley Rectory and I storyboarded the thing not really paying any attention whatsoever to the, the complexity of the shots or the timings of the shots especially because I wanted it I wanted it to be slow and to be creepy and for the reenactments of the seances to be you know literally played out in real time and slow and have this slow burn and something that storyboarded looked like it was the sequence was probably going to be about five, you know three minutes long and then after we'd filmed it and i cut that one scene together and it was that first sound is 12 minutes long there's no way this film's <laughs> going to be 20 minutes is there and i did the first cut and it was it was just shy of 70 minutes. <laughs> so it, the only person who uh, has accidentally made an animated feature, <laughs> it was <laughs> stupid. It was incredible, but it did, it, it kind of, it grew organically. And because I, because I had that luxury of, I, I was piecing together the edit and then looking at each cut and thinking, oh, we, we need like a long, slow shot of an eerie corridor now as we get this bit of narration comes in and it I just kept making it bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger until it, it was a short that organically grew into a feature which is why it took me years because I was making it by myself. <laughs> so, I think um, Alien Outbreak was about three and a half I think yeah. but Ro Robot World was a lot longer the first one I mean if, if, you, if I really went Back to the beginning to the end it was probably about six years just justin uh, <clears throat> from start to finish well i, I kind of uh, mm, from from the writing of the screenplay um there was i think from the time i wrote uh, i started writing the screenplay to when i'd shot um the or complete uh, principal photography was i think it was less than six months but then i spent a period of time um, cut, cutting the thing, and um, and that was longer. It was it was under two years. It, it, it was um, yeah, and and I would have taken longer over it to be honest, and it, I would have um, I, I probably would have had a much better result if I had taken longer. Um, but there were people people that were involved casting that were keen to look at it. Uh, and I ended up towards the end just cobbling it together. Um, uh, so yeah, th I, if 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 I'd have had my way, I probably would have taken longer on it because that you know that's that's the thing I wish I'd done now is, is taken my time a bit more care on things. Um, but yeah, I'd say from start to finish, uh, yeah, just under two years, I think it was. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, Ashley. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, we recorded the very first thing we did was recorded Julian uh, Sands' narration, and that was recorded in December two thousand and eleven. Um, and then the film, I think the film had its final cut because even though it went out to festivals and things, there were bits in it, there were mistakes in it, and all sorts of things that weren't correct. So. I think the final cut was done in February 2018. So, but I mean, you know, it's animated and there was also a, about a two year period right near the beginning where we had funding and then suddenly we didn't have funding. So we had, we had a long period where I was sort of developing the artwork and the style, but there was a, there was a huge area of procrastination right at the beginning where nothing was happening. It was like a dead ship in the water kind of thing. So, so it was, it was a lengthy process and you just kind of go, Oh, I'll put that to one side for a minute. I better get on with something else and just, you know, just keep my ear to the ground and hope we find another way of, of funding it, which inevitably led to, you know, crowdfunding. Yeah. Anthony? Uh, 12 years. That was uh, <laughs> You win. <laughs> <laughs> no other way of putting it. It was 12 years. It was, it's, like, it's, it's like on Quint's boat, isn't it? Everybody's showing off their scars. And things, you know? <laughs> uh, 
Uh, Indianapolis. Oh, don't worry, you broke my heart. Anyway, um, <laughs> it was yeah, it was it was it was it was it was long. Everything every time we thought, great, we're a year away from getting it done. Uh, we weren't. It, originally, I think it was going to be like a year and a half. I remember we did the first, we did the American World for London Dock. That was like a year and a half, two years, I think is what it took from when we first started to shoot into when we finally got it done. And and I thought it would be exactly the same for the for the Ghostbusters Dock, and it just was not. Um, it took a long time to get all the interviews that we wanted. That took, I think, took about six or seven years. Just And just because we, you know, you, we couldn't fit in schedules and... You know, we, Dan Aykroyd is a major part of us that we thought at that point that we needed to get him for an interview. And every time we were in the States, he was like, or oh, at some point in the States, he was on the other side and we could never, it took us four years to finally nail him down. Um, so it was, that took a long time. And it was like 20, I think 2016 was the last interviews. And then that time since has been all the, you know, we had an edit but it's refining it, doing the motion graph, you know, you know, much like yourself, actually, it was like a lot of animated bits and, and doing all these things and finding archive stuff. And then it just, and, and, and constantly refining that edit. And, and we kind of got it done. Uh, where are we now? So around about 18 months ago, I think we were like, now nah, that's it. We're finally done. And then we had to go through the legal clearances. And that took another six months. And then we, a load of other problems I won't go into there, which which dragged it on a little bit more until we finally had a kind of release this year and which was it's kind of surreal because I didn't actually it just still didn't feel like it's actually finally been released because even now I'm you know still doing bits and bobs but so there you go 12 years <laughs> and, and and Lucy and we're going to start the conversation well, it sounds really pathetic, but it was only four years for me. What has been your biggest learning curve as a feature film director? And then and then Ooh. and then you go first, you can pass it on to anyone. Biggest learning curve. Um, sticking to your guns when you've got 30 people all coming at you with different opinions about one thing and having to say no we're doing it like this because that's what it needs to be and everyone going okay let's do that and sometimes it can be i don't know a bit overwhelming when things or everything goes wrong because no matter what no matter how much planning you do everything will go wrong and you've got to just take it on the chin and say no we're, we're gonna find a way of doing it and having that well of endless optimism and resource there to just keep plowing through it. I think that's the biggest learning cliff you can not prepare for. But nothing will ever prepare you for that, but you've just got to make it work. Um, but yeah, I, I think Ashley would have a different one with that because you don't have as many people to sort of, you know, try and corral when it's just you on your own. Yeah, I mean, you know, I've, I've fired my animation department many, many times throughout the creation of Bully Retry. And I said, it's just not happening fast enough. You know, um, yeah, it was a bit of a words with yourself then, yeah. in the <laughs> mirror. Strong like, oh. words, yeah, knuckle down. Um, you know, it was a bit of a strange because it was, it was quite, um, apart from the shoot, I mean, the shoots were beautifully kind of orchestrated by Tom Atkinson, my producer. Um, but I mean, the, you know, in terms of production, there were only about sort of three or four of us doing it. And when it came down to the actual animation and even the edit, you know, the, the fine edit, I did the edit myself as well. It was quite a strange kind of isolating solitary kind of existence really so I mean I think that even though that was wonderful in terms of demented control because you just start going mad and just get, becoming obsessed with certain elements and things I think that um, you know I'm writing a couple of features at the moment and I think that there would definitely be a bit more of um, the learning curve will be a bit more of sharing out the load a bit more, you know, a, a final, the final cut, the, you know, the, the dictatorship in terms of the story and the direction, absolutely. But th there has to be, I have to be able to hand something to other people and actually work with a, like a, a, a crew again. Um, and the thing is, I will probably have animated elements in the next one because I don't think I could completely let that go. Um, but it will be, it'd be much more of a live action thing, but it, I'm going to try and do something quite strange and uh, approach a, a haunted house thing, much in the way that um, Gerald Scarf approached something like Pink Floyd's The Wall and to have a kind of weird marriage of 
demented live action and even more demented kind of animation to kind of marry these things. So I think that's my learning curve. It's like, I, I, I love animation, but my God, it takes a long time when you're doing it all by yourself. So let's not do it. Let's do less of it. And if I'm going to do more, I need to get a team. I can't just, you know, you can't sit there for four or five years just doing it by yourself. It's crazy. You need to delegate, you know, you really do. So I'm um, throwing a question to Neil, I think. Hmm. Yeah, I, I'm quite similar to Ashley, actually. Um, although I don't mind the um, sat, sat on my own for years working on the visual effects. I probably enjoy that more than, than I do the actual production side of things, but definitely my, my learning curve is, is to get, get more crew on board and, and dish out the responsibilities. The um, alien outbreak, I ran the camera and directed, and that was a big mistake, big mistake. So it just, my, my time was taken up constantly with the camera, and so you just, and then so when it came to actually shooting, it was, I just didn't have the time to really work a scene through or anything. It was just kind of, let's just get this, let's get it going and get it done. And, oh God, the camera's not working. And, you know, mm. and then similarly in, in post, I think I, I would um, probably not edit um, or, or certainly not do the first edit myself next time because on both of them otherwise by the time you get to you get to the the finish line or getting with the finish line in sight you're absolutely sick of the project <laughs> and, and, and so just the, the worst thing is is the thought of actually sitting down and having to watch it beginning to end to check the edit so i i think anything that can reduce the amount of time i have to spend staring at it and um, I, I think would be a good thing yep <laughs> um, justin anything that yeah, covering some similar ground, really. Uh, being able to uh, uh, let let go a little bit, and and um, it, instead of making sure that I'm, you know, uh, writing, directing, editing. Uh, although on tour, and I did, I didn't do. Uh, I did. I did some camera work actually, um, but um, j just allow other people to do those things, uh, and um, instead of sort of. Uh, taking control of everything, you know, allowing people to sort of do those things. You can always obviously, you know, uh, get into the mix and sort of make alterations to the edit and stuff like that. But um, yeah, I, I, I think the, um, what happened on Torn was uh, originally I wasn't um, going to be producing it myself. I was only going to be sort of directing it and I ended up producing it as well. So it ended up being one of those things where, um, where I would be um, on location where we would be filming and I would be pushing pushing it along rather than sort of directing scenes, I'd be just sort of making sure that they were happening and pushing on sort of um, to make sure that we could, rather than making sure everything was done right. Uh, and although that sort of time and money is always a factor, um, I, uh, I'm i a bit more careful these days to make sure that I get things right because I, otherwise uh, I don't like finding myself in an edit sort of cobbling things together which aren't exactly as I wanted them or as, as they were written in the first place. Um, so I, I think that's the, the, the biggest lesson I took away from tour. The, 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 whole, the whole of tour was a, an exercise for me anyway, an experiment to see what I could get away with, um, with as little time and money and everything as, as possible anyway. So the whole thing was, was supposed to be a sort of a, a learning curve for me anyway, you know. Um, so, but yeah, definitely sort of uh, being able to delegate and uh, taking taking time on on uh, you know every single shot because they're all important. And Anthony, um, I have apps. I, I stopped making unrealistic deadlines to myself. I think it's one thing I've learned to do. Should have like more on alcohol for the whole thing. I really should have done. <laughs> uh, with uh, I, I I I don't know what the biggest learning curve with this was. Just, I suppose I learned a lot about my own strengths and weaknesses through the whole thing. And, and I think it's like, it's like Lucy was saying, you know, there's times when you get a lot of opinions about how people think your film should be. And there's a point where I'm very open to listen to those opinions and taking them on board. And there's a time where you can put my foot down and say, no, this is the way that it's going to be. And we're going to stick with it like that. This works. That doesn't. 
And if you don't like it, then you can walk away from it. It's, it's a very simple kind of process. Um, and I think it, I learn a lot about my own resolve through it over, you know, but then, then again, people do grow and change a lot over 12 years, I've found. Um, so I'm starting a lot greater than it was when I started. Um, so it's, uh, yeah, I, I don't know if there was any major, there has been, I think it's just, it's just I've learned a lot more, certainly over the last 18 months, than like all of the kind of like the distribution side of it and, and how the sales and stuff gets done. That has been a huge learning curve and, and, and learning who to trust and who not to trust and, and, and put, in, put your faith into. And, and it's like saying about like the delegating and stuff. And there were some jobs that I was like, no, I can, oh, I can do it. I can do it. I'll do it. It'll, it'll be fine. It'll save us a fortune. And it's like, yeah, but you know, we're getting a bit of money. We, you need to get these things done professionally by people. And then, and some things we did and some people did amazing jobs. And then some people weren't as professional as I was led to believe. And then you end up in a bigger problem trying to fix the whole of them set of issues so it's just like i just i think learning to trust my gut instincts a little bit sometimes and then other times probably not learning to trust it quite as much as i did um so it's it's just a lot of um, conflicting feelings is what i've got through this whole thing but it's just yeah it's i think it's just about learning, just knowing the story i think just kind of like the whole thing has been about i knew the story what we wanted to tell and that responsibility falls on me and it falls on claire who's like producing it as well and we've been those that core team, so it's been, yeah, it's, it's been it's been great. There's been there's been some really kind of low points to be fair, but for the most part, it's been high points. And I'm looking forward to kind of carrying on and doing more things. Maybe doing an actual proper film that I can write a script and get it shot and finished in quite 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 a quick amount of time in comparison to twelve years. No, I'd agree with you. A distribution turns into a bit of a dark art sometimes. It's just like. Oh, I've made a film. Now what? And then, oh, <laughs> yeah. that's it's, the thing I have to think about. I was, I was talking about this with a friend recently. It's like you, these are the things when at least when I went to film school, nobody told you about it. It's like this is how, this is how you make a film. This is how you do this. This is a camera. These are the lights. Three point lighting setup. This is amazing. I didn't know this before. And then it's like, so now what do we do? Now, oh, okay, well now we've got all these other students. We've got to teach now. We've got to. It's like, blah, 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 blah. And it's like, where, where am I supposed to go here? And you are, and it is an utter minefield. And some experiences have been great. Mm. And somebody here shares the same UK distributors of Streambound is what we've got the, the yeah with it. ah that's what I thought it was yeah 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 so we've got Screenbound are looking after um, Borley and that's because the um, Nucleus films have like a long history of oh with yeah, Jake West yeah yeah, yeah Jake yeah. West and Mark Morris yeah and he said that um, and I really trust those guys anyway so that's Screenbound came about through them and, he, he, and again it was it was this kind of you know dealing with old punks. So I kind of trust them because <laughs> they're not going to muck you about, you know. And he just said, no, they're like, they're like jet blokes. It's right. You can trust them. They're all right. I was like, good, good. Because that's exactly what I need. Because, you know, there's, like you say, it's a minefield. You just don't know. There's so many people that would just rob you blind or just treat you really badly. And I, I had quite a long, I've had chats with other, you know, like quite established directors and things. And they've said they've had horrible horrible experiences with distributors and sales agents who were just like crooked lawyers and things they, they've had terrible terrible times and it, this stuff doesn't get mentioned when you're learning the business it's one of those things where you're just kind of you stumble out through the door at the end of it thinking at last it's finished and then it's oh my god i won't drop any names but i know no. a director <laughs> that um he went on holiday to germany turned on the, t um, the hotel TV and his film was screening in Germany and he went to his um, sales agent and was like, you didn't tell me you saw the territories and you didn't X, Y, Z and all this. And they said, oh yeah, about that. Um, it's just resting in my account. Um, we'll sort that out later. And it's just like, oh. Yeah, it's incredible. And it's would so never, have, Would never have known if he hadn't happened to be in the hotel in Germany at the time. It's like, so the most report, rewarding part of filmmaking, now sometimes for me, it's, um, I'm, a, I'm a bit like running around my room, you finish the edit and it's like, uh, and then the next day you notice something that's wrong with it. And you, uh, <laughs> um, but throwing it out to uh, Ashley, uh, when you finish yes. Bali Rectory, or, or, or the process of making it, what's the most rewarding part of being a director? Well, um, yeah, I and mean, it was pretty rewarding coming to the end of that film, obviously, because it took so long. Um, 
there was um the funny thing was that I, I remember at the uh, at two of the premiere performances i did notice that there was a typo in the end epilogue texts <laughs> which nobody else noticed which was brilliant because it said there's um the vc uh, vc wall who was the reporter that went to borley rectory he worked for the daily mirror and when i typed up those end crawls to say what happened to the characters and you know mm. um somehow it corrected it to the daily mail so the information was just completely wrong on the end on the, on the end section and i'm sat there in manchester at the print works view you're like seeing this thing like the size of a skyscraper on this massive screen i'm kind of going oh brilliant it's a typo in it that's good and you just think oh good nobody else has noticed um i th I, th I think it's like with anything with um the, the satisfaction of getting to the end of a project is just, especially one that's been, that has been a struggle, is just that feeling that you have been tenacious enough to get from what seemed like a crazy pipe dream and, and to realise it and for it to be there and out there. I think that's, that's the greatest feeling of accomplishment. It is that feeling that, um, as often it seems like, why am I doing this to myself? That it, um, that if you if you stick to your guns, if you're tough and you're resilient, that you can achieve pretty much anything. And I think that's it's it's a nice feeling. It doesn't always last that long because <laughs> then sometimes you're there going, oh god, I know how am I ever going to make another one. Um, but it is it's it, it is a it is a, a an extraordinary feeling um, to you know as a kid. Like I think with most of us here, I think we share that experience of of, of loving films from when we were children and then to be able to sit there and kind of go I made one you know and you walk into a shop and it's there and you can hand somebody a, a, a blu-ray or a dvd or something and think well I made that I made that it is that lovely thing and, and for me personally it was a nice thing because, um, because I've got kids as well it was a nice thing to be able to say you know that it was tough but this is proof that it's not impossible directing Alien Outbreak as a director what, what, what was there a moment on set or that you thought yeah yeah I, I think definitely with with that one for me it was um, work, working with actors um, the, which was my first time because first film was just me and my brother and and so he was the only literally the only actor on screen so then um, working with um, other actors, you know, sort of professional actors, but people I don't really know, and and seeing them come together and they barely know each other, and seeing them sort of work together on, on screen and and read out <laughs> read out the words you've written in a script and sort of take them seriously, you know, and without a blink of an eye, and you're kind of like, really, <laughs> you're, so, you're, you're sat on your own writing a script and you sort of think, oh, they're just gonna laugh when they read this. You know, but no, see, see them come on set and take the work seriously and, and really sort of put their their passion into it. That that was quite quite surprised. That, that was quite quite um, yeah. It got me a couple of times actually. And how 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 is it for you, Justin? Because I know you 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 brought some very strong scripts, and um, when you've come to the film festival. Um, I've seen you. You've watched every film. You, you're a lover of film. How did that? Yeah. How did that go into your your scripts and doing your first feature and with actors and yeah. Well, I before before I did Torn. I mean, I I had quite a history in sort of film and TV production, sort of anyway. And Torn was a way for me to. I'd had a bit of a break of uh, quite a few years, and Torn was a way for me to dip my toe in a sort of um, filmmaking. Um, and, uh, and and basically see what I could get away with um, with the resources that I had available to me um, and just give myself the most punishing time possible because it's, you know, obviously, as we all know, sort of filmmaking is extremely hard anyway. I wanted to be able to tackle the, the worst case scenarios um, so that I could learn from them um, so that I could take those experiences and apply them to um, future productions, basically. So, so that that was what I I, um, 
want, wanted those things to be. And, and you're right, you know, I go to festivals and things like that, and I, I do try and watch as much content as I possibly can. I want to see what other people are doing. Um, uh, not not only people that are succeeding. I, I, I know it's. Uh, I don't like to be negative about anyone. I mean, because it's, so, it's such a tough thing to do. You know, uh, make shorts or features. But I like to so you can learn from from you know everybody's mistakes. You know, uh, where where things don't work, so you can take things away from that and and apply them to your own work and and you know try to avoid those things with with the the finished sort of products and things but yeah i i kind of um yeah i, I just try and sort of take for, for anything on you know at festivals or at home or you know um any any sort of content i'm sort of absorbing sort of try and learn from that you know yeah uh, lucy uh, what was your most inspiring moment directing scary um, the very last day of our three week principal photography shoot was um, we were doing the sort of a historical reenactment bit um, which is a very short sort of flashback scene within the film but we were down on Sheldon Beach and these reenactors who um, had just sort of turned up I hadn't had a chance to meet them before but they came in their full sort of historical regalia and this other group of people who also I hadn't had a chance to meet but had been sorted out by the producer and everything else with them in rowboat and it, because it hadn't actually, I hadn't had much prep with it prior to that actually happening on the day, I was just blown away by the fact that there was all these people who somehow had been convinced that this was a good enough idea to be involved with and they all turned up on the right time to do it and there were muskets going off and it was just the most surreal thing. It was an absolute joy and I, I still apologise to this day to my poor sound um, sound recordist for uh, not warning her about the muskets because they were very enthusiastic about firing those muskets. <laughs> I'm just so glad that they didn't blow her equipment. Um, <laughs> but no, it was just very much in the same as what Ashley was saying. It's kind of like convincing people to be involved for long enough for something to actually be finished and actually having that relief of like, it's a thing, it's, an actually, it's, it's done. And all these people have somehow believed in something that I wanted to do strongly enough to actually get it done and you can't be thankful enough so so anthony um question for you um when you went down at cried harold ramus did you get to an end of interview and think i wish you said that and did you say did you direct and say could you say that for me that because um, <laughs> how was that um i no i didn't the only things we got on to say was like the like the advert in Ghostbusters, like, are you troubled by strange noises in the middle of the night? And I was going to, I did in the end, I had to edit this thing. And there's been certain moments in the film where we had some voiceover, somebody did some animation, and, uh, and Ernie is the one voicing it. So I had to direct him, which I didn't realise I was kind of doing until I was doing it. It was just like, he was over here at a convention. It's just like, if you, yeah, if you could do it. Oh, he goes, yeah, no, no problem. And then you, you wire up all the sound and then he's asking you questions about the character. And it's just like, Christ, <laughs> it's, like, it's like, and then you, you're actually directing some, and it's like, this is directed, and then he's a lovely better anyway. Um, so the, the little moments like that, little gem, because that is like, you know, when, you, when you're listening to, I, mean, it's just, I, mean, I like hearing stories. So that's essentially where it all comes, stems from. So when you're hearing stories about their early beginnings and their early days and all that, and you realise that sometimes it's not a million miles away from my early days or anyone else's. And you realise that, yeah, they've come from sort of like some you know, little town from the middle of nowhere and they've progressed. And then you realise, OK, some of these things are actually quite possible. It isn't, you know, how I ended up doing this was just kind of one of those things. It wasn't necessarily planned. It just kind of like, oh, I think it would be awesome to do that. And then you kind of realise at some point or other you are. But they are, I mean, they would... You know, people like that, Richard Edland, who like started up at ILM. I mean, he listens to them talk, and it's just like I wouldn't even know where to start because they're like their stories are just yes, their stories of Star Wars and inventing Star Wars and how they did stuff, and it's just like and stuff you I I didn't even realize half the stuff that they needed to know to just to do that. But to them, but they're all like hippies as well, so they're all just like so chilled and just like in the zone about it. They were Richard Edland's such a lovely fella. So um, we're getting to the end of a uh, panel today. Now we're we're based in the southwest. We're based in in, in Devon, I think, all of us, or a bit a bit better that way. Um, 
what's it like to be based in the southwest and the people people that you work you work with um if i start with neil so i know you used quite a few local actors and things in in alien outbreak yeah um <clears throat> yeah well it was great really i mean um location wise first of all i mean i think that was one of the first challenges we had was, was finding locations what we wanted to do and um we found most people really really supportive they um they tend to fit into one of two brackets they either kind of love film and they want to help out and they're kind of yeah come you know come and use our our property or whatever do what you want or, or they're the other bracket they don't really care about what you're doing and they just want to try and charge you lots of money and and so we just found it was best to walk away from those people and just find new locations um and then when it came to um casting yeah the, we we found there's loads of um great uh great people down here that, that not only not only to audition but to help you out with that process to help you out to find uh, your, your actors and get your casting call out there all sorts of people helped us with um, DNC film and Phoenix Center um, you know all, all people that didn't really have anything to gain from from your film but they, they helped you get the, uh, the the cast that you needed um, so I, I think it's a great place to shoot I mean it goes without saying the actual scenery of, of um, the southwest is great um, but yeah I, I think there's a lot of support down here yeah. Lucy well um, I'd have to say in the similar line to Neil that the extra little bits that you need to get a film done I found the support in Devon to be fantastic particularly um, for it, filming in Dawlish um, the local cabbie took it upon himself to become crew, like crew transport and could not have gone any further above and beyond um, and I feel really saddened that it because it took so long to get the film out that his personal health struggles um, got the better of him and he never actually got to see the final result which was a real shame but everyone around it yeah it was a real community spirit that they couldn't have helped out any more than they you know than they did and so much so that when we were trying to do the village fate scene we had extras that just turned up um so we ended up making them into sort of you know special featured bits because it was just so surreal that one of the local um so there we are we're trying to sort of create our own fake village fake thing and then the local um fancy dress shop decided to send two of its staff dressed in full um like animal outfits just to go and stand in the back of our shots so we didn't ask them to they just turned up <laughs> And I think that was it just little things like that added so much to the film that you, you can't ask for that. It just happened. It was, yeah, I loved it for that. And I think that's one of the things that this part of the world gives, that everyone's just a little bit crazy and a little bit enthusiastic. Uh, Justin? Uh, I cheated, John. Uh, I imported my actors. Um... <laughs> it was since then, I know you've worked with quite a few. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I'm torn. Well, I tell you, because when I when I was knocking talk together, it was uh, I um, hadn't been based here that long. I had trouble trying to, uh, and I, I kind of put feelers out everywhere, and I had trouble trying to get anybody to take any interest whatsoever in the film. Um, so I cast the net a lot wider and 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 got um, uh, my main cast from from the, the London. Um, but when I came to, uh, I started the principal photography and then once I had some footage, I was able to sort of get people sort of in the area sort of interested and then they came in to sort of take part in sort of some of the larger set pieces. So, um, so that was the stage when they come in. And like you say, since then, I've kind of, the, the projects I've worked on have been with a lot of sort of local talent and um, certain people that, that I've, I've continued to work with, you know, who I think are very good um so yeah there's there's um you know it's it's like any area of uh of, of a production you know there there's some people stronger than others but you can kind of find that you know uh people sort of strong areas and kind of focus on those and um tailor certain roles to them and, and things like that so yeah but yeah there's there's plenty of talent down here john yeah Brilliant. Um, Anthony, I know your your sort of cast and crew were internet all over the place. So, 
Yeah, I mean, well, Derek's uh, near Memphis, um, so he's not exactly local. Uh, <laughs> but I edited, you know, most ch a huge chunk of the doc was all in this on this spare machine. You know, the Apple Store did a fine job. My mom supplied me with lots of tea during long edit days, so I can't complain. And Bay Printing did me some lovely T-shirts and painting, so I'm I, I cannot knock them. Um, but they, I, when I've done other things down here. And, and it's been when I've like come out of London and you come down here, the difference between, you know, London, how much to down here. Oh, yeah, oh, a film. Oh, wow, yeah. And then it's like, it's like oh, my God, they're just laying all this stuff. This is amazing. So I've always found them to be, I think that's the thing. When they know you're genuine and you are, you're there, and when you turn it with like people and, and all that and boom poles and things like that, then all of a sudden it's like, oh, okay, it's quite genuine. So I've always found them to be really good. And it's, and it's, it's suited me to be out of like the, the hustle and bustle of London. So I could just kind of sit and focus on what I need to focus on. Uh, that's been that's been great to be able to come down here. It's been nice. I mean, now I'm back down here permanently, but when I was flitting backwards and forwards to London and stuff, it was always nice to have this as a base to kind of because London's great and there's all that kind of stuff that goes on there. But it's just nice to get away from it and come here and just just kind of chill out sometimes and do things in a less pressurized environment. So until my sister comes and ruins the whole thing, she's all she does is stress me out. Anyway, that's a, that's a producer's job, I suppose. Uh, Ashley, <laughs> yeah, I mean, um, most of the uh, most of the film was shot in in London at the VFX Co, um, and a lot of the voiceover stuff was done at Trident. But when it came to doing a lot of the the, the, like the pickup shots, especially stuff with the ghosts, because I didn't want it to be like really kind of clock watching, and this is costing us how many hundreds of pounds of, 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 of you know an hour or whatever it was, you know. Um, I kind of leant back on my old ally, which was the Exit of Phoenix. It was the Exit of Phoenix is whose um, um, grants got me making the, the animated short films when I first moved back here. You know, after doing the whole kind of, you know, BBC Manchester and then trying to make it in London. And I came back here and just thought I was going to make whatever I want now. And the Phoenix was always there for me, you know. So I, I really enjoyed doing all the ghost shoots, weirdly, at the Phoenix and just to kind of, commandeering their art studios and filling it with green curtains and dressing up these people as whether it's a nun or a scary guy in a top hat or whatever um there is a good there is a good network of of filmmakers and and crew down here I, you know my my producer i mean he's off in america now <laughs> <laughs> but he's um you know he's he's Devon born and bred and we met at college in Exeter together and you know we, we both had this understanding it's like yeah it's great working in London um, but it, there is also you know I love Devon I grew up in Devon I love Dartmoor um, I, lo I love the local stories I love the mythology I love the landscape it's um it is a fantastic place to live you know London's a great place to visit and to do projects and to work there but I, I genuinely feel very lucky to live in this this part of the world and for me it's an endless source of inspiration you know whether it's the people or whether it's the the history or whether it's the the folklore you know I love the place I'll wave a little flag <laughs> So um, we've come to the end of the panel. It's been, been fantastic. You guys have similar sort of crossing over and different experiences that you've been through. Um, but this is this is the last bit, a bit to plug where we can find your work. Where, where can we find your film? So if we start with Lucy and then you just throw it over to the next direction when you finish. So. Okay. Um, Scary Crows can be found on Amazon or iTunes or YouTube as well. So um, please check it out. Justin? Uh, yeah, Tom can be found on YouTube, and um, I, uh, my work, a lot of my shorts and things could be found uh, on my Facebook page, and there's a YouTube page with my work on, and a Vimeo page, so it's all, all floating around out there on the internet. Uh, Ashley? Yeah, um, uh, Carrion Films has a presence on Facebook and Twitter, um, under the humorously monikered carrion screaming um but uh Bawley retry is out on uh, a lovely blu-ray from nucleus films 
uh, which is available direct from them or also on Amazon. Um, and it's also spring, uh, streaming on Prime Video as well. So it is out there. But I recommend the Blu-ray because we spent about eight months making extra features and documentaries and interviews on that thing. We went completely bananas. So, so Nucleus has done a lovely job with it. Uh, ooh, who should we go for? Hmm. Hmm. Uh, so Anthony. Oh, cool. uh, me. Um, where is it? It's, uh, I think it's all on VOD. So um, it's on iTunes. I can't remember where it all is now. So it's on iTunes. <laughs> Get it on, uh, on Amazon. And I think it's, I think on the VOD side, you can order the Blu-ray through Amazon and Zavi. I think it's there. It was out of stock and I think it might be restocked. Not sure. It's going to be in HMV um, and FOP in stores uh, in September. I think that's going to be coming out, which I'm, just, I'm, and the same thing, you know, if you get the Blu-ray, get the Blu-ray. So the Blu-ray, Blu-ray, it's physical medium, you know, it's not going to be changed. You know, no one's bottom is going to be CG out like something on the <laughs> It's going to be the way it is. And they, and it's, it's, you know, Streambound is the one that's distributing um, it as well. And they really did a cracking job on it. We're really pleased with it. Nice booklet and a few extra features on there and stuff. So you get the Blu-ray, get the Blu-ray, but it is on VOD. I know it's high cheating. I should have had this all. Well, I should have a little list so I could run down it. Um, but most wherever else you get me, I see I never download films like ever. It's like if I can't buy it physically, or if it doesn't pop up on Sky on Netflix, then I don't, I can't just sitting on a hard drive, it bothers me. So I never really pay attention to it, but it is on iTunes, I don't know that much. So, but yeah, HMV and all that. And if you see it, you know, do some hashtaggy type things to say, yeah, that's a really big thing these days, like that in HMV or wherever you're going to do. Anyway, so there you go, that's where it is at the minute, Neil. Alien Outbreak came out well, about a month ago now, so we're still just about hanging in there in, in all major supermarkets and HMV. And it, it's a great time to buy because it's just dropped to five pounds. So <laughs> <laughs> go out and buy it. Uh, but yeah, and, and it's on the um, all the streaming services as well. So. And uh, one more little thing, if you could just say one line each to a filmmaker that's starting out, inspiration, one line of inspiration in getting to filmmaking. Uh, Lucy, and then pass it over to the next person. This is aimed, um, aimed at college students, especially uh, at them college and extra college. And <laughs> okay. Um, don't be afraid of being crazy. Ashley? Um, just don't do it. <laughs> no, I, I think that you, you have to find an idea that you're utterly, utterly passionate about. Yeah. Um, Neil? And be done. Um, and, and, and don't listen to anyone that sort of says, it can't because you've got to have this piece of equipment or you can't because you've got to do it this kind of way or you can't because you're not, the monitor isn't calibrated. It, it, it can, it doesn't have to be a certain way. You, you, you can do it and, and just go and do it and finish it. Yeah, oh, is it, uh, me? Uh, um, it's going to students. So it's like, so put the drinks down, get writing, stop messing about, this isn't fun, it's serious. Just stick it, always stick it in. Don't don't ever be put out. You will there's a lot of very positive people, there's a lot of very negative people. Keep plowing through because it, it is rewarding. No matter what you make at the end of it, even if you like what you finished at the end, it doesn't matter. The fact that you've actually gone and done it and you learn from it, hopefully, and the next thing will be even better. Just keep plowing away at it. But put the drink down. <laughs> Just think your what's your pearls of wisdom? Yeah, I, I think um, sort of attaching to some of those things. I think that it, it's uh, that anybody that's uh, considering sort of uh, filmmaking uh, in any capacity, is, I think it, it's important that people know that it's okay to fail, um, and and that you will learn a lot from uh, your mistakes. Probably you will learn more from the mistakes than you do from your successes. So I, I think yeah, my line would be that it's okay to fail. 